With me is uh, Dr. Stephen B. Sharper, uh, who is an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. And he's also an associate professor at the Centre for Environment at the University of Toronto. He teaches courses on religion and ecology and is a frequent contributor to numerous magazines and newspapers and writes a regular column for the Toronto Star. He's author of Redeeming the Time, A Political Theology of the Environment, and he's co-author of The Green Bible. He is also co-founder of the Canadian Forum on Religion and Ecology, which seeks to explore religious worldviews and ethics in order to broaden our understanding of current environmental concerns within the Canadian context. So good morning, Professor Sharper. Good morning, Simon. Um, in your book, Redeeming the Time, you describe the environmental crisis as a spiritual crisis. Uh, what do you mean by this? Well, I think spirituality touches on relationships, and our relationships not only with the divine, if we conceive of a divine as existing, but between ourselves, ourselves and our community, ourselves and the natural world. And right now, we are experiencing what people have called an environmental crisis, and I don't think we have to rehearse all those dimensions here. I'll just highlight one. We are losing tropical rainforest, the cornucopia of biodiversity on the planet, at the rate of one football field per second, an area the size of Austria per year. So if we were to go to the center of Varsity Stadium and stand in the middle of the football field and count one, two, three, three times that area of tropical rainforest has just been destroyed. This is a crisis that we're experiencing throughout the world in terms of not only loss of biodiversity, but climate change and all the attendant kinds of havoc that wreaks. For example, the United Nations just announced that for the first time, environmental refugees outnumber economic refugees in our planet. So this is quite something, and it was explored in a recent film, Refugees of the Blue Planet, done by a Canadian filmmaker. So we're experiencing an environmental and social crisis. The environmental crisis, because it touches the human spirit, even for non-religious people, becomes a crisis of relationship. But with most crises, there's also opportunities, crossroads, and choices to be taken. And this environmental moment is also an opportunity for new relationships and new establishing of relationships, both structurally, politically, environmentally. And that's what's hopeful here. That's what's interesting, that we are be ch being challenged to look differently at how our educational system is established, how our transportation and cities are established, how we relate to the natural world. So it's an opportunity for this new relationship. Okay. So also in that book, Redeeming the Time, you, you talk about political, political theology. Um, so in what sense is theology political in a nation that believes in the separation of church and state? How can theology be political? Well, that is a particular term that comes from Western Europe. And there's a series of German political theologians, Jürgen um, Moltmann, Johannes Metz, Dorothy Zolle, who for them said that issues of justice, equity, and social compassion are essential to the Christian gospel, not ancillary. Liberation theology of Latin America has also picked up on this. It was articulated, for example, in 1971 by the World Synod of Catholic Bishops, who wrote, We believe that action on behalf of justice is a constitutive dimension of the preaching of the gospel. In other words, a political economy approach that takes issues of power and justice seriously is not ancillary to a Christian message. It's actually essential. It's not a Velcro add-on to be torn off at the slightest provocation. It's part and parcel of what it means to adhere to the gospel. And so when I use the term of political theology of the environment, I'm invoking that tradition and also a theology that takes its import in terms of justice, economic equity, and social transformation seriously. Because the way of Christ is very much a political... Exactly. I mean, it's 
often forgotten that Jesus was killed as a political prisoner, that it was the Roman Empire that put him to death in their usual manner, crucifixion. Even though he upset religious authorities, he obviously ran afoul of the long fist of the Roman Empire in first century Palestine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was indeed as a political prisoner that he was executed. Right. So I I understand then that you also are quite involved in the political scene right now. Or in in what capacity? What are you... Well, I'm with a group called Democrats Abroad Canada. I'm on the executive of that. Uh, Others are far more active than I. But one of the main... Yes, you're an American citizen, right? That's right, an American citizen. And one of the main um, features of Democrats Abroad Canada is to encourage Americans living abroad to vote. They can register and vote in presidential elections and other elections. So the idea is to register them so that they can vote in the upcoming elections. So part of that means uh, going to events and having uh, people sign up and register for receiving their ballots. I've also been involved in some of the work around uh, going to the convention, not this year. I wasn't a delegate. Some of our members were delegates and actually helped participate in the selection of Barack Obama. Um, In Boston, I went as an observer for Democrats abroad at the convention four years ago. Right. Okay. Well, I think I'll move on to the big question now about... uh, uh, I'm curious about your, your comments on the political influence of Protestant evangelicals in Canada and the States, um, particularly on environmental policy. Um, both uh, Stephen Harper, who's the Canadian uh, Prime Minister, and Sarah Palin, uh, who's the American Vice Presidential Candidate for the Republicans, both of these uh, political figures are evangelical. Uh, Palin is a Pentecostal, and Harper belongs to the Christian and Missionary Alliance uh, denomination. Now, would you say that the political theology of Christian evangelism has an impact on uh, environmental policy, on whether it's in the States or Canada? And and if so, how? First off, yes, absolutely. But I just want to preface these remarks by saying the environmental policies of both Harper and Palin are quite atrocious, uh, in my view. The fact that Canada under Harper has stalled the Kyoto Agreement, and even tried to torpedo at Bali, Indonesia, an international agreement at the 11th hour on the future steps of Kyoto, is quite a disgrace for Canada. Also, uh, this is part of the reason he has received an F-plus from the Sierra Club for his (coughs) environmental policies. Palin, on the other hand, (laughs) is dramatically and breathtakingly anti-environmental. For example, she has engaged in a lawsuit against the Bush administration to have polar bears removed from the threatened species list. Why? Because it impedes oil and gas drilling in Alaska. So when she is further right on the environment than the Bush administration, we know we have a a bit of a difficulty. Secondly, she has paid for and encouraged bounty on wolves so that people can kill wolves, cut off their paws, and bring them for remuneration. And also encouraged aerial hunting of wolves. It's one reason why the Humane Society, which has a legal arm that has never endorsed a presidential candidate, has come out in favor of Barack. And in their decision, they say the dramatically anti-animal policies of Sarah Palin have led to our decision to endorse Barack Obama. So that's just by way of preface. In terms of the role of Christian evangelicals in this debate, Mm -hmm. this is quite interesting because Everyone normally assumes that evangelicals are more conservative, more Republican in the United States, or more PC here, and therefore would support these policies. It's not as monochromatic as that. For example, you have in the United States the Evangelical Environmental Network, and this was set up after 1990 when 32 world-renowned scientists, including Carl Sagan, um, Freeman Dyson, E.O. Wilson, wrote an open letter to the religious communities taking uh, the environment seriously and encouraging them to do the same. As a result of that, evangelicals, along with other denominations, began to focus on the environment, and they actually were very successful in opposing the rollback of the Endangered Species Act in the United States under Newt Gingrich's leadership in Congress. Today, Richard Sizek, who heads a national group of evangelicals, is also on board with climate change and has been working very steadily and consistently to get evangelicals to face up to the realities of this, despite opposition from 
other quarters of the environmental movement. There's an excellent documentary by Bill Moyers called Is God Green? I've seen that, yeah. yeah. And there's that wonderful scene of the Boise, Idaho preacher who is a Republican NRA hunter who comes out and articulates his support for the environment. (laughs) And the language is interesting. He says, we're not doing this because Mother Earth wants it, but because Father God tells us to. (laughs) However, there is that strain in the evangelical movement that sees human dominion and the human footprint as writ large in Scripture and therefore sees a parallel between, say, blowing the tops off mountains in Kentucky for coal or drilling in the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge and the role of the human in exploiting the planet as taking dominion over it. And so this is an area that has been explored, I think, by some of the uh, members of the conservative party as well as members of the Republican Party to gain support in those areas. Is there also a belief that there's uh, there can be a human co- cooperation in bringing on a future Armageddon, whether it relates to Israel or um, uh, environmental nuclear conflagration? Yes, there's this apocalyptic dimension that suggests that, in a sense, conflagration is the prelude to the second coming of Jesus. And there have been some people on a fundamentalist attack who have, in a sense, encouraged both a um, destruction of the earth policy, because this is in keeping, perhaps, with the kind of apocalypticism that might bring about the second coming, and also the focus on Israel in the sense that Israel would be the center of where this happens, and many evangelicals support certain dimensions of um, uh, Israeli policy, partly because they think that's going to be the epicenter of some of this change. Bill Moyers, again, has looked at some of that apocalyptic strain in the evangelical network. Um, I'm not fully versed in all of those uh, permutations, but it is a kind of um, uh, worrisome trend where apocalypticism is tied in with environmental destruction for a kind of religious quest. What must the political theology, then, of the environment address if it is to speak uh, credibly and constructively to the contemporary situation, the contemporary crisis? What, um, what, what would an environmentally friendly political theology emphasize? Well, again, I think the work of Thomas Berry, a geologian and cultural historian, is helpful here. He talks about the universe not as a collection of objects, but as a communion of subjects. And this is partly a critique of a kind of consumer commodification, a consumerist worldview that sees the world basically as a place of plunder, that the universe is not a collection of subjects, or communion of subjects, but a collection of objects to be bought, sold, used, and discarded. So part of the spiritual pulse of this new moment is seeing ourselves in different sh- relationship to our economy, to one another, and to the world itself. So you begin to kind of embrace what Aldo Leopold, the great father of environmental ethics, as it were, called the biotic community. His land ethics suggested a thing is right when it maintains the integrity, beauty, and stability of the biotic community, and that we must learn to develop love, respect, and admiration for the land. In a sense, our ethics must be ethics of compassion. And so part of what a political theology of the environment moves toward is that kind of compassionate understanding of radical interrelationship with all that is. And secondly, in this interrelationship, the place of the poor and the destitute and the marginalized is not forgotten. And the equation is made between those who live at the margins of society and those who live at the margins of our ecosystems. Both are being exploited and trammeled by similar forces. And then just quickly, just the last question, how would you describe then the role of the human if not... um um, to have, get out of that anthropocentric, you know, that human-centric perspective? Yes. Is that I, possible? I think it is possible. It's beginning to happen. So we move from a model of master and conqueror, but we don't go all the way to the role of being just a passive passenger. This is something that I've tried to articulate as anthropoharmonism. We can never lose our human gaze. We can never view the world as a beluga whale would. But what we can do is begin to see ourselves not as masters and lords, but as plain citizens in harmony 
with all other creatures. It doesn't mean we're powerless and our power will fluctuate, but it does mean that we have a kind of humility in our role. Great. Well, well thanks so much for joining us, uh, Dr. Sharper. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you, Simon. Uh, we've been speaking with uh, Dr. Stephen B. Sharper, who is an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, and also at the Centre for the Environment at the University of Toronto.